This is Johnny with Tiger Bomb MMA, and tonight I'll be going over UFC 280, Oliveira versus Makhachev, taking place in Abu Dhabi. My God, am I excited for this fight. I have a baby shower I have to go to, and like I have to go to this. I can't skip it like my mom's wedding. Uh, I have to go to this baby shower. So like I've made arrangements with my cousin. I'm like, dude, fuck your baby. I'm going to be watching the fights on my phone, so don't bother me. Just bring me food. So I'm, I'm super excited for this entire card. It's a little heavy, you know, when it comes to like the, the main card. But overall, I, I would consider it to be a pretty solid card. Even the the prelim main event I'm excited for, which sucks to say because Bilal Muhammad's in it. And I'm not a fan of Bilal Muhammad, but Sean Brady's in there. And I'm a big fan of Sean Brady. So let's see how this fight card goes. Let me get started with the first fight of the night. Taking place at Bantamweight, we've got... Lena Lins, Lands, Lansberg, Landsberg, Felipe Linz, Lena Landsberg versus Carol Hosa. What the hell is Carol Hosa's nickname? She doesn't have one, but Elbow Queen. Lena Landsberg is always fun to watch. Uh, Elbow Queen for a reason. She likes her Muay Thai, likes her elbows. Currently, she is plus 200, the Swede versus Carol Hosa. Wait, I think she's been degraded, downgraded to Carol Rosa because of that last performance against Sarah McMahon, but she is minus 250. So we've got a 27-year-old versus a 40-year-old. It's a women's MMA bout. I don't really want to spend too much time on it. It, it. To me, it's a simple fight. It's a simple fight. Lena Landsberg might be retiring after this one because she's up in age, although I'll give her credit. she She's looked pretty decent at her age, um, but you know she's fighting a, a, a lady that despite screwing a lot of people, a lot of money in her last fight with Sarah McMahon, who's also pushing 40 or beyond 40 at this point. Like You might try to go with that whole voodoo bullshit, like, is she going to lose another 40-year-old? She will not, because uh, Lena Landsberg isn't going to shoot for any takedowns. If anything, Carol Rosa is going to be the one shooting takedowns in this fight. I think her output's going to be better. Yes, Lena is, is dangerous if she cuts her with an elbow. That'll be some serious issues. That's just more of like a massive stunt from Carol Rosa if she decides to want to stand and bang with Lena Landsberg, but just take her down. Granted, Landsberg, again, as I mentioned, her fight with Panny Kianzat, she looked significantly better. You know, she made it a pretty competitive fight with Panny, but Panny eventually got the win again. But in, in this particular fight, Carol Rosa, I think if she keeps it on the feet, she'll do enough when it comes to the, the volume to really outpace uh, Lena Landsberg, and then at that point, just take it to the ground, just mix it up. And you know what? It, it's really a fight for Caro to Caro to get back on on track after that last performance. Granted, you know, giving Carol Rosa shit for that last performance is like kind of standard. You know, she has to feel bad for what she did. But I'll give her some credit though. Despite her being a pretty significant favorite, she did she didn't necessarily quit from from that fight. You know, she was getting dominated on the ground by by Sarah McMahon, the silver medalist. And I think in the third round, if I remember correctly, she did try to push a pace on her. But mm, just I remember specifically saying if Carol Rosa gets taken down, I think her jiu-jitsu and her activity from the bottom would be enough to like either sway the judges or get back up. She won't just kind of flop on her back. She did that, and it pissed me off. So I'm still kind of like weary on her, although I do think she's kind of a safe bet, kind of a parlay piece. It's a women's MMA bout, so you never know what can happen, right? Stunt City when it comes to these fights. So I'm going to go with Carol Rosa. I'm going to go with her by a decision. I don't think she'll finish Lena Landsberg. If she does, good good on her. But uh, as a minus 250 favorite, again, I might put her on a couple parlays, those of which that I know I'm going to lose just because, you know, the, 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 the thing of not betting women's MMA. But... Yeah, I think she gets it done pretty, pretty easily. So I'll go with Carol Rosa by decision. Next bout. Ooh, my boy Mocha. Not really my boy. I just call him that because uh, he's going to win me some money in this fight. I, I would say it's pretty safe to take Mokaev either under or inside the distance. Or if you really, at, what I find fascinating about these bouts, it's funny, I, I'm not even going to read you the, the, well, I will, fuck it. Minus 700 for Mocha, I have Malcolm X Gordon plus 500. Malcolm Gordon cost me a good amount of money by breaking the arm of Dennis Bondar. I thought Bondar was going to wreck him. And he came out aggressive, give him props. You know, he's got two UFC wins as of late. You know, his two UFC losses were pretty embarrassing, right? So you think insta-fade, right? Insta-fade on this guy. 
And that's all I did. Didn't really do any research on the guy because even though he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, he, he did not look anywhere near UFC caliber. He didn't even look like a, a UFC or a black belt in general, like the way Al Bazi handled him. But as we've noticed, Al Bazi, although he's a, either a brown belt or, or a purple belt, he is a much better grappler than most of these black belts. When it comes to this fight with Mokaev, the Punisher, I I have my doubts about Mokaev, right? But as you can see in my what I call my fight cards, where you can see the, the pictures, one guy, the most significant damage I've seen him take is when he landed on his head, suplexing a guy. And the most significant damage I've taken, uh, Malcolm Gordon's taken on his uh, UFC career, was when he like basically flopped against Sumadarji. I, I cannot trust Malcolm Gordon, nor do I expect him to win. He's going to get finished. It's these spots where I'm like, how is he going to get finished? Is he going to get submitted? More than likely, I would say by a submission, right? It'd just be the smarter thing to go. But if Mokaev wants to perform in Abu Dhabi and he wants to get a knockout, that could be a problem, right? Say if he wants to stand and bang and get that knockout, I doubt he'll do that. But since he's only 22 years old, that immaturity might come in. I don't necessarily see him doing that. I, I've not seen him do anything stupid in the past. I think he takes him down, either pounds him out or submits him. What I mean, it's kind of a dangerous play when it comes to taking the prop. If I was Mo Mohamed Mokayev, say you're Mohamed Mokayev, and you know you're going to win this fight, and you decide you flip a coin one day and you're like, am I going to submit him or am I going to knock him out? Say the land, it lands on knockout. Most of the public is already expecting you to submit the guy and he goes out there and pounds him out. So that's why I'm saying like, be a little cautious when you're placing your prop bets on this one. But frankly, I do expect him to win by a submission inside the distance uh, to be safe. I'm going to say round number one, because it should just be a simple round. Number one, I'll go uh, round number one submission. Malcolm Gordon, I don't see him having any shot. But stranger things have happened, but it's just not likely to happen in this in this matchup. Next bout, a much more competitive bout, in my opinion. We've got Armin Petrosian versus AJ Dobson. And the odds on this one have it in favor of the Armenian, minus 220 comeback on Dobson, plus 180. And I find it a bit fascinating that AJ Dobson's a plus 180. Right, like the guy, the guy isn't all that bad to be a plus 180. Like, I think he can win this fight. Whether I'm picking him to win, whether I'm betting on him to win is a different story. But I do think this fight can be a bit more competitive because although I love what Armin does on the feet, right, he is explosive. Watching his uh, his tape in the past, like he gets taken down, he gets back up, and he does the necessary things you have to do when, say, you've been smothered for essentially a round and you've got 60 seconds left you go ballistic on him you throw kicks you you're not afraid to throw your hands or your kicks and i like that about armin but we did see that if you intend on holding him and jujitsu the man it can be a bit tricky for him like yeah he can get back up he's been training his get-up game and like um in rush i forget it's not chechnya it was a uh, dagestan i was gonna say chechnya got in trouble once for miss uh remembering those two but the, the guy is very good. A.J. Dobson, although he is 30 years old, I would say he's kind of still mature in his overall MMA career. They both are 6-2 and two for Petrosian and 6-1 and one for Dobson. His, his lone loss coming to Jacob Malkoon, who I picked Dobson to beat Malkoon. I thought his athleticism, his takedown defense was going to be good enough. And, you know, the, just the pace and the pressure got to him. And I don't think that's enough. Like, oh, Jacob Malkoon beating you is enough to me to, like, toss this guy aside. The guy trains with Mark Coleman, UFC legend, and Matt Brown, another UFC legend, right? He, he's got the willingness to learn, the willingness to really put his time and energy in the gym. And he's got that extra level of, of athleticism that can make this fight a lot more competitive. I do think he can implement some wrestling, some ground and pound from the godfather of ground and pound being on his corner and make it a lot closer right whether he can hold the partrosian down it's going to be a it's going to be tough right like i think he's worth a shot i might take a shot on him and i mean a minuscule shot like i, I don't want to put all my eggs in his basket when it comes to Petrosian, though on the feet he is going to be the much better much more credentialed striker it's it's really to me a dog or pass situation i, I don't think i want to add armin to any possible parlays 
it's going to be a fun fight because again, AJ's got power. He can absolutely knock out Armin Petrosian. Like I, I think of these matchups like minus two twenty for Armin. It, it reminds me of like uh, Crow Cop versus oh dear God, uh, Kevin Randleman. I almost forgot his name. I would have been ashamed of that, but no one gave Kevin Randleman a shot against the striker, the credential kickboxing, he knocks him out just because of that added level of, of the takedown, right? Like the takedown being presented might cause, you know, hands to go down and boom, the shot from AJ Dobson knocks him out because of those like feelings of like, maybe it's a dog or pass. I think I'm going to go with AJ as a pick again. I'm not certain if I'm going to really put a solid amount of money on him. I might even add him on, a dumbass parley of mine because I do feel like he has that level of athleticism. If you look at the picture that I posted, like he, he's pushing away Jacob Malkoon to a point that it kind of looks like he's giving birth to his head. So I, I think his takedown defense, his cardio is going to really be better because he's not going to be in constant threat of a takedown. He might himself implement these takedowns. And for that particular reason, I'm, I'm going to take a shot on him. And uh, yeah, I'll take, Dobson by a decision. I, I think it might play out a lot closer. Like I think a lot of people and even the bookies are are thinking that Petrosian being that he's a better striker and that he he's fought better competition, beat Gregory Rodriguez and such. Uh, I know he got backpacked a bit by Caio Bohalio. I, I don't want to overhype him yet, right? I, I want to see how he does against AJ Dobson, who is probably looking to murder someone after that last fight of getting smothered by Jacob Malkoon. So I'll go with Dobson by decision. Oh, this this bout isn't happening, but I would have taken Magomed Mustafaev. Uh, this Yamamoto kid, he did. If I saw tape on him, he was not very good. He was giving up takedowns. He, nineteen years old, he would have gotten destroyed. Um, yeah, th this fight I think got uh, it got Ixnade because I think his former promotion he was still under contract, so whatever. On to the next bout. Zubaira Tukaga versus Lucas Almeida. I think it's a little different on topology, but I'll, I'll go through this one. So we've got Zubaira Tukaga minus 155. Come back on Lucas Almeida plus 135. Let me take a swig. If you boys like Haritos, Jaritos, as I call it when I go to Mexican restaurants to piss them off. Uh, I think I like the grapefruit Toronja the best. That's probably the, like my favorite one. But Tukaga versus Almeida. Number one, I'm a big fan of Lucas Almeida. Although I I don't always pick him to win. He's just so much fun to watch. Like he goes out there and tries to kill you. I picked him. I picked against him against Mike Trezano. I thought Trezano was going to really implement a point fighting style to negate all the like aggression and power from Almeida. And surprisingly. Um, Trezano knocked him down, but Almeida showed a ton of heart. He came back. He ended up knocking out Trezano himself, who's kind of tough to, to, to finish. He's always been re relatively durable. Zubaira, on the other hand, he is a mixed bag. His last time out in Abu Dhabi, he lost to Hakeem Dawadu two years ago. And I had money on him. I know people that had money on him. He should have won that fight. I I, I, I don't know what's going on with him. Like So you got to be careful with this guy, especially if he misses weight. He's very unreliable, right? Obviously trains with Khabib. And his last time out against Ricardo Ramos, you know, he, he did fairly well. He he looked every bit as I expected him to look against Akeem Dawadu. So it's really like minus 155. He should, in theory, be a lot heavier favorite, minus 200 and, and beyond because of that added wrestling. But he does slow down. His striking's good. It's just, I don't know what it is about this guy that he's just so unreliable. Lucas Almeida, for damn sure, he's going to go out there and try to perform, right? He's going to try to knock you out. Just that added level of the takedown and the stalling that can really be presented by Tukagov, I think it's going to sway his favor. I think he's going to win this one by a decision. It it may not be the prettiest win because, again, Almeida's going to try to take his head off. And, uh, yeah, I... I I'm more kind of thinking like, are they are the judges really gonna give it to Almeida if it's really close? I'm gonna say no. Uh, Zabiro's not losing this one, so I really think they're gonna give him the the win back against uh, Dawudu in this fight. So even if he gets knocked out, they'll restart the matchup, and I think they'll still give it to Zabiro Tukigov. 
because they'll be like, yeah, he got knocked out in the first round, but he ended up winning the last two rounds of two to one. Zabira Tukagov, uh, same thing with like Chael Sonnen. Like he tapped out in the last round, but he had already beaten him down in four rounds. So technically speaking, he beat the champ in uh, Anderson Silva. Using that logic is always fun. Next bout, Volkan Uzdemir versus Nikita Krylov. And this one taking place at light heavyweight. This one's tough, right? The the odds have it in favor of Nikita Krylov, minus 170. Come back on Volkan Uzdemir, plus 145. It's really the battle of the two kind of journeyman gatekeepers in that division of 205. They're never going to touch gold, but there are a certain tests you have to beat before you can move on to fighting like the top of the division. They are currently ranked 8 and 11. With Krylov, he's always been one of these guys that I've, I've always liked to watch, right? I've always rooted for him back in the days where he was the Al Capone and he became the minor. He's always been super fun to watch, right? Like fighting in heavyweight. He's a big boy back in the day. He, I remember he knocked out, um, oh, dude, what's his name? The big ticket, Walt Harris, or like a head kick. Uh, little things about Nikita Krylov, and he's only 30 years old. So it's just like, how fucking old is this guy, right? He, I've been seeing him since I was like uh, in my early 20s. So when it comes to this fight, it, it's such a it's such a coin toss, really, because you think, oh, yeah, he beat the shit out of Alexander Gustafson in like no time, pun intended with uh, Volkan Uzdemir's being his nickname. Is beating the shit out of Alexander Volk? Volkanovsky, god damn it, Alexander Volkanovsky. I, I would take Alexander Volkanovsky against both these guys. But Alexander Gustafson is beating the shit out of a washed up Gustafson. Really that impressive. I would have taken oh, Volkan Uzdemir to knock him out. I actually took um, Gustafson to beat Krilov, which is like a bad look in the long run, but I thought he might have still had it, mostly because Krilov, he tends to do really dumb things in there. Like, when he should be striking, he wrestles. When he wrestles, he, he should be striking. Like, what are you doing, dude? Like, just just stop doing these boneheaded moves. Or like, he, he should have beat Paul Craig, right? He didn't. I picked him to beat Paul Craig. Like, I cannot pick this guy's fights for the shit. Uh, Magomed, I picked Magomed to beat him because, of course I would. Uh, Johnny Walker, I picked Johnny Walker to beat him. He decided to wrestle. Worked out for him. Like, he's just so hard to really cap sometimes he's very talented he can grapple he can kickbox he's, he's got like that karate background Volkan Uzdemir on the other hand I, I think he possesses some some certain qualities obviously the power I think his takedown defense has gotten a lot better overall and his striking I, I think his striking is going to potentially look better here against Krilov which is another striker I really do think Krilov is going to shoot for a takedown and Volkan's going to keep it on the feet not necessarily light them up, but land them much more impactful strikes. I really do think this goes to a decision, and I think it's going to be really close. And in these close call matchups, I, I got to go with the dog. Like I have my doubts about Krilov, and again, I have not been picking his fights well worth a damn. And even for me, like I picked Paul Craig to beat uh, Uzdemir, so I'm, I'm bad at picking these guys' fights in that particular reason, right? Like He showed me at least something – against Paul Craig, if you look at it, it's not a MMA math kind of thing. I just liked what I saw from Volkan Uzdemir. He played it really smart. He slowed the pace down. He stopped the takedowns. But there were some issues there where Paul Craig was landing shots on him as well. You know, Paul Craig, his, his striking's not great, but it's mostly because of his, I guess, fear of keeping it on the feet. Like, his striking's not too bad. Like, if he's confident on the feet, I think he lands punches. He might have even hurt Uzdemir, but he was just honestly too much of a pussy. He kept, you know, spamming takedowns. Uh, again, it's going to be a tough, tough matchup. I'm going to take the dog in Volkan Uzdemir because, again, like, it, it, to me, it's like a 55-45. Like, it, I, I really don't know. And just with the judges, you can't always be – you can't always be safe with these guys. You can't always predict all oh, this guy's going to win because the judges, right? Judges don't always see things. And I think the boxing style of Volkan Uzdemir, he mostly throws punches. He obviously throws leg kicks. He's more of a punching guy opposed to like Krilov who throws more head kicks and whatnot. I, I think that's going to sway the judges more. Boxing judges for the win. I'll go Volkan Uzdemir by decision. 
Okay, I think I missed a fight, which was the uh, Abu Bakar. Let me make sure. Yep. Mother fudge. Let me go back. I did miss it. I'll just say it now. Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov versus Gadzi Omar Gadziev. Hmm, this one's also kind of interesting because currently they have it in favor of Nurmagomedov minus 175. Come back on Gadzi is plus 150. Now, the biggest difference between these two guys, because I think they're kind of a mirror matchup, is the height and reach, which is quite perplexing the height advantage goes to omar Gadziev, who is i should mention going back to uh, welterweight actually i shouldn't say back i really don't know if he was ever a welterweight but he fought at middleweight his last fight uh but he is six foot one 71 and a half inch reach come back on abu bakar he is 511 with a inch and a half reach advantage 73 inches total now what i saw from omar Gadziev, like he's got the wrestling pedigree he's a grinder right he's very good on top but his striking appeared to be absolute uh, dog doo-doo, especially against Kyle Bohalio, who obviously just kind of ran a train on him. He, he just, I could not get behind this guy striking, right? Like, he's fighting a Nurmagomedov. He's not winning this fight, right? He's just not going to win. So I'm going to go with uh, with Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov for the sole reason, like, they are kind of a mirror matchup, right? They're very similar I think Abu Bakr's striking is just much better, and I think his takedown defense is going to come into play here. He's going to probably keep it on the feet and just land on him. His striking has ever improved. Like against Jared Gooden, he was kind of piecing up Jared Gooden there, and I was very surprised at how comfortable he seemed on the feet. He is obviously like the the lesser Nurmagomedov, the cousin, like the one that kind of didn't necessarily train. They're like, hey, go get us some water while we're sparring. He's like, yes, sir. Uh, so he's not the best Nurmagomedov. It, just to me, the striking is going to be the biggest difference. Like Godzi, yes, his, his wrestling might equal Nurmagomedov's in general. I just don't think that the striking will. I, I think Abu Bakar striking on the feet, his boxing has just gotten a lot better since his last loss against David Zawada, where he got caught in a triangle, which is really damn funny. We'll see, though. Like If that height and that size advantage from Godzi comes into play, yes, he can probably win the fight just based off of possible scrambles and just being the bigger guy, being able to keep top control for a certain bit of time. So it could even play that way. I even see Tapology has it very, very close, 49% for Omar Gadziev and 51 for Nurmagomedov. But to me, I really do think that Nurmagomedov striking is just going to be the extra added factor in there. So it stays on the feet where they cannot take each other down or one tries to take the other down and they just get stuffed. At that point, plan B, the striking Abu Bakar striking, I would say, is better. So I'll go with Abu Bakar. This one is going to a decision. I think both guys are, are pretty tough overall, right? Like, I, I think Abu Bakar can take a shot. Omar Gadziev, although he got, I guess, technically finished, it was like an illegal lead, and it went to a technical decision against uh, Kyle Baalio. Oh, man, I, I just don't think they did Gadzi any favors here, right? Even if he wins this fight, I think it's going to be a tough fight. But let's move on to... Let's pretend none of this happened. Middleweight bout. We've got Mahmoud Muradov versus Kyle Bohalio. Speak of the devil. This one is fascinating, right? We haven't seen Mahmoud Muradov since he fucked me against GM3, that piece of shit. I was in, uh, I was in San Diego with Jose, and we're eating fucking, uh, uh, what was it, barbecue. We're watching fights. We're going back home, and I'm like, yeah, like I was not having the best time when it comes to betting, because like I was up and down, up and down, and I'm live betting, and this fight comes up like, you know what? I'm going to put everything on Mahmoud Muradov. He should easily knock out GM3. And then we saw what happened. And I've got, I, I do have a theory on it, so I'll, I'll speak on that real quick. Let me drink a, another swig. So yeah, me and Jose are driving back to LA from San Diego, and Mahmoud Muradov doing really well against Mershart, right? He's landing punches. He even hurts him at a certain point. The, the guy's striking is very good, obviously. Like, he's team Money Mayweather, right? He's he's sponsored by those guys. The Becky Stanin, the guy's very solid, right? He's a very solid fighter. <laughs> I can see why he is plus 180, right? That 
threat of the takedown, the threat of the submission, Kyle Bojalio has really shown to be like, I know he's like the MMA nerd. He's a nickname, the natural. He's very natural in there. I like the way he mixes things up, but it, it, to me, it boggles me. Like mm, it should be a little closer, right? I would line it a little closer where it's like minus minus 150 plus 120. I really think that'd be a lot more appealing to me if I wanted to take, for example, Kyle Bahalio. I, I think right now minus 220, I don't think it's going to be that easy for him, right? Like uh, not to say that minus 220 means he's going to go in there and just dominate him or even finish him. Like that's more of like a minus 600 type of play. Pardon me. But Mahmoud, his striking really is impressive, right? His boxing is very good. The way he he sets his shots up, the knockout power. But yeah, when watching that fight with him and GM3, uh, GM3 does kind of nut tap him, if I remember this correctly. And after that, he kind of seemed like his energy was drained and he just wasn't the same fighter. GM3 was landing punches. And then he eventually takes him down, chokes him out with the rear naked choke which destroyed me, man. I was like, motherfucker, man. <laughs> I don't often bet like a ton of money when I'm doing it online. I usually go to the casino. So I had maybe a couple hundred bucks in my in my account, and I decided to like, yeah, I'm just going to put it on Mahmoud to, to finish uh, GM3. You know, it just made logical sense. And then, again, this is not a very logical sport, which is precisely why I like it so damn much. But, yeah, when it comes to this fight, obviously the, the simple narrative is Kyle Bojalio is going to do exactly what he did against Armin Petrosian, who is a very similar style when it comes to the threat of the striking, right? Not in the sense that they're the same type of striker. I, I think Mahmoud present, presents more difficulties because he's more of a puncher than, say, Armin. He's more of a kicker in a sense. And I, I just I, I worry about Mahmoud being able to land cleanly on Kyle and really shifting the dynamic of the fight. It really just takes one solid punch to put Kyle on queer street and he's not going to be reacting the same. Like it just sucks seeing those type of fights, like similar to how I saw Mahmoud. He, he went from being incredibly fast and landing clean strikes to just kind of being depleted. And he just wasn't the same led to his finish. But I really do think though, Kyle wins this fight. If he is smart still, He's going to be a bit undersized, though. He's five foot ten allegedly. We'll see when they face off. Similar, exactly the same reach: 75, 75 for each. Six foot two for Mahmoud Muradov. Now, Kayo, he was able to backpack and kind of hold Armin Petrosian, who is also a like, six foot three guy. We'll see how this goes, though, because again, like if he has the same game plan, I like Kayo's striking as well. He's got the Machida stance and throws the left hand very nicely. Um, I'll still stick with Kayo to win this one by a decision. I just do think that there might be a bit of value on Mahmoud here because, again, he's been away since that last fight was about a year ago, a little over a year ago. I want to see how his wrestling and his defense has really come about. So if he can stuff takedowns, if he can, like, avoid getting clinched and body locked against the cage, like what Kayo's going to try to do to him. It might be interesting if he could, if he's able to break, uh, if he's able to break the clinch and start landing punches and like exiting the clinch, like with an elbow or a shot. It could be very fascinating, and you know, I'll probably not touch this fight betting wise, but I really do think it's going to be entertaining as shit. But I'll I'll go with Kyle because again, I, I just think he's got the total package overall. His striking is pretty damn good. You know, he just needs a little bit more of the finishing ability. If he was more of a finish threat. I do think he would just honestly be a lot more favored and I would be more confident in him, but he doesn't tend to have like a whole ton of power in his shots and his, you know, jujitsu, although it's very good, very technical. I just don't see him as an overall threat. Like he's not going to go from, you know, taking the back to an arm bar unless he's a hundred percent sure he's got it. Like if he was willing to take more, more chances, I, I'd probably be a bit more confident on him, but I'll go with, Reluctantly, Bohalio, but again, I'm going to watch Muradov and I might take him as a live bet depending on how the fight goes. Whew. Next bout, main event of the prelims. We've got Bilal Mohammed versus Sean Brady. This fight has been plaguing me because 
like I I do not like Bilal Muhammad, right? I don't like him in the sense of like his fighting style. I think he's super boring. Like I don't know what it is. I take it personal that he is like so bad at like performing. Like he wins fights, and I guess that's all that really matters in the long run, right? If you're taking your money and putting it on Bilal Muhammad, like props right like he beat some good guys but he's just so damn boring like god I, I just don't like watching him fight sean brady on the other hand like he's very fun to watch right he's a very jujitsu oriented guy he gets uh he gets wicked submissions like that one arm guillotine against christian aguilera like he submitted jake matthews with an arm triangle made him gurgle in there like he was uh, drowning in uh <clears throat> never mind but uh that kiesa fight was concerning right like he he was able to out wrestle kiesa but he was getting tagged on the feet uh kind of showed his like achilles heel in there like i know kiesa he's one of these other guys i've never really liked kiesa but i give him his due he is a very difficult guy to fight sometimes like he's got the submission threat the wrestling ability but he's kind of goofy too like on the feet you might think like this guy can't strike with the shit but he he's got like that awkward lanky body and he just throws certain strikes that don't look like they're going to hurt you. And then you're on the ground like, what the hell? He has sneaky power. And that's what kind of concerned me. Right? Like Sean Brady striking, it, just, it, it looked kind of piss poor to me against against Sean Brady. Or Sean Brady's uh, striking looked piss poor against Michael Chiesa where he had to resort, resort to the wrestling. And, you know, with a big guy like him, Chiesa, that is, it just – it it – deflated my hype for Sean Brady. I, I still think he's a fantastic fighter. I still think he can win this fight. Absolutely. And I was riding on that train. I'm like, Sean Brady's probably going to win this fight. When this fight was announced, I'm like, yeah, his wrestling is going to be able to negate Bilal Muhammad's wrestling. He's going to be able to take him down. He's going to probably submit him. But then I'm like, am I wishfully thinking that? Is that what I really think is going to happen? Like, am I breaking this down logically? Am I just pissed off that maybe Bilal Muhammad beat Vicente Luque and Wonder Boy? Am I that butthurt? And I'm like, mm, no, it's not that I'm butthurt. It's more of like, that's what I want to happen, I suppose. But when I start looking at this fight, it's minus 140 for Sean Brady and plus 115 for Bilal Muhammad. Bilal Muhammad, though, despite me not liking his style, like, again, it's just his style. I don't dislike the guy personally. Like, I think he's a funny guy, but he does say some shit sometimes. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. His style is incredibly boring, and it is incredibly effective. His takedown defense has improved. His striking has improved. And granted, his striking isn't great, right? But his lateral movement is tricky to time. Um, this again, his takedown defense against Maya. I really thought Maya was going to beat him. I'm like, yeah, Maya's going to take him down. He's going to hold him, going to backpack him. Although, you know, it was more of Maya showing his age at that point. Had it been maybe a, a year or so later, I think Maya would still take it. It's just really when it comes down to it, Bilal Muhammad has perfected his style. He's finally getting in the groove of things. The reason he's always talking about, I can beat this guy and I can beat that guy, and he's confident in himself is because of that. Like, I think he's finally perfected that style of it's not the most entertaining, but it is very effective where he takes you down where he needs to take you down. He'll strike with you until you feel comfortable. Maybe like, Oh, I'm going to catch him here. He gives me an opening kind of like how he did against Vicente Luque. And then he, he goes for the takedown himself. Like again, his striking, like he's willing to strike with guys, right? He was beating guys like uh, Diego Lima on the feet until he kind of got cracked a bit. Um, Damn, that other cyborg. I can't remember his name. <laughs> Whatever. But um, it pains me to say because I really want Sean Brady to win. And I really do think Sean can win. He's a big boy. He's got the jujitsu. I think he's got the, the overall wrestling and grappling advantage. But in an MMA bout, where Bilal Muhammad could potentially either sweep him or get on top or just be boring... I think his striking is going to be the X factor in this fight. Again, like he's, he's so, I guess the best word I can say is solid on the feet, right? That lateral movement that he uses can really trip people up. You're chasing him down. And I guess at this point, if he is pushing himself back into the cage, Sean Brady can attempt to go for a takedown there, but will he not be there to get taken down? Will he move? And then I don't create a scramble. 
if they're damn it, I hate to say it, if their wrestling negates each other, I do think Bilal has the more experienced striking pedigree. You know, obviously training with like Duke Rufus at one point, and uh, I don't know if he still trains with uh, what's his name, Bahamundes and Rodriguez or whatever. I, I just think he'll have the the edge on the feet, and uh, we'll see. We'll see if he pops or steroids, but I'll go with Bilal Muhammad by a decision on this one, and it fucking pains me to say that. It really does. That's how you know I really do think he wins this one because I do not like Bilal, and I still have that inkling feeling that Sean Brady wins this one, but as a minus 140, like I got to get on that train of taking Bilal Muhammad as an underdog. But uh, let's get uh, to the main card. Well, before we do that, make sure you like, share, subscribe. I don't like doing that. I really don't ask asking. Like, it's more of like a, if you like what you see, you're going to like and subscribe. If you don't like what you see, you're just going to fucking ignore me. But I would hope that when you see the Tiger Bomb logo or my fucking face on the, uh, on the uh, what do you call it? The thumbnail, that you'll be like, oh, who is this? Uh... I'm not allowed to say these bad words. So who is this? Uh male who is attracted to males on my computer screen <laughs> and hopefully you uh you get enticed to watch but let's get started with the main card the battle of the blonde fighters baby oh i should probably switch over here we go <laughs> i just saw the picture that's fucking funny uh just getting kicked in the face with a foot but manon furo the beast versus blonde fighter caitlin chukagan caitlin is a plus 160 come back on the french lady is a minus 190. They are both in their 30s. They're both five foot. No, I guess Manon Furo is a little shorter. Five foot seven for Furo. Come back on. Chukagian is a five foot nine. Chukagian has a two inch reach advantage. Is Chukagian going to kill the hype of potentially seeing Manon Furo fight for the title against the ultimate blonde, Valentina Shevchenko? Maybe. Uh, this is a dangerous fight. Chukagian being an underdog, it's always worth the shot. Uh, Furo has the striking advantage, right? To an extent. The The mystery of Caitlin Chukagian is that she is so damn good everywhere, but she's not a threat anywhere. <laughs> she is so good on the feet, but she's not going to knock you out. You're in danger of losing a decision on the feet. On the ground, she actually is a bit of a threat there, right? She's she's so long and blanky. She's able to use her jujitsu. She's got solid damn jujitsu. She's so good. She's able to like negate girls like Jennifer Maya, you know, beat up girls on the ground like uh damn Amanda Hebas. I, I don't want to get in that Amanda Hebas fight. She lost that fight. I might do a breakdown of it one day if it ever needs to be done. But you know, she beat Viviana Arujo, who's a strong woman herself, Cynthia Calvillo. The days of disrespecting Caitlin Chukagian for me are gone, other than the fact, obviously, that she point fights and she goes to, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Manon Firo is very similar in that sense, but her strikes actually hurt you. Like, she's a very good kickboxer. And, you know, if, if you're thinking, oh, Caitlin Chukagian, all she has to do is take her down, not really the case. Manon Firo, I had to burp, sorry. Manon Firo. Or I think she's a purple belt now in jujitsu. Like she has been from day one mixing things up. Like you might think she's primarily just a kickboxer. It's not really the case. She she's been working on her overall game, like the jujitsu. She was able to beat Myra Bueno Silva by taking her down and holding her there. That's just so funny to sell to me. And she herself beat Jennifer Maya, which was kind of like a, oh, you got to be careful here. But it really comes down to is Manon Furo really the real deal? And I'm not too certain on that, right? Like, I think she definitely has a way to win this fight, but I think it's going to be really, really close because Chukagian is so goofy, man. And I mean that in such a good way. Like, she's so goofy on the feet. She's able to mix things up so damn well. She's been there. She's got more experience than Manon Firo, right? And I think this really is her biggest matchup, her biggest test, because it is the battle of the blonde fighters who will be the ultimate blonde fighter in this matchup. Like Manon being minus 190 with that striking pedigree, right? Because she hits harder, I would I would really think she can beat Caitlin, but there's always that doubt in me. I'm like, I really think Caitlin can win this fight. 
and to me, I just I don't know if Manon's going to have that much power to. I guess I shouldn't be thinking of it. I guess as a power because if Manon Furo had more of like knockout power, she's more of like a blitzer. She'll she'll bombard you with strikes. But if she had power behind her, like a you know knock one punch knockout power, I think it would really negate a lot of Caitlyn's attacks, right? Like moving forward and knee to the body, hard knee to the body would really dis discourage her from trying to clinch up or try to take you down. Really, I, I just think it's going to come down to who's got the better footwork. Caitlyn's footwork isn't traditional, but it's very effective. Manon Firol is more traditional, and I think with her aggression, I, I just think she might edge it, right? It's worth a shot to take on Caitlyn, really, but I'll, I'll take a pick on Furo. If I was going to bet, I would take Caitlyn Chukagan. More than likely, though, if I do take this shot, it's going to be like not necessarily live, but before the fight comes up. Like, say, for example, Sean Brady just chokes the shit out of Bilal Muhammad, and I'm on an all time high. I'm like, fuck yeah. I'm going to put some money on Caitlyn Chukagan. That's probably how I'll take her. But for me, I'll go with Manon Firo by decision. It might even be a fucky decision where it's like, hmm, I think Caitlin won. And then <laughs> I just remember. Then Caitlin goes on Twitter and uh, <laughs> she starts sharing uh, black pornography like she did. But <laughs> I'll go with Manon Firo to, to win this one by decision. Next bout. Here's where shit's getting really, really good. Because back when me and Jose were talking about Mateus Gamrot versus Armin Saruki, and we were talking about the possible matchups. Oh, fuck. I left the Getty image there. And usually what I do, boys, I stretch it out. <laughs> so the uh, the name tag here covers up any sort of stolen imagery. And in this case, I must have forgot. I was so damn busy this week as why you're getting this kind of late. But uh, I fucked up on this one. <laughs> but anyways, we were talking about, oh, Mateus Gamrot, if he wins this fight against Armin Saruki, in which I still think Armin won, but I'm not going to die on that hill right now. Uh, the possibilities of, like, Benio Darius and even potentially getting, like, Islam Makhachev before the, the title fight and, you know, the, the top of the division, right? And here we are, Benio Darius versus Matthias Gamrot. To me, this is, like, oh, shit, it's going to be great. Benny Darius plus 165, come back on Matthias Gamrot, minus 195. 33 years old for Benil, 31 for Mateus Gamrot. I was so like certain on this one when I heard it because I thought to myself, ooh, I think Gamrot knocks out Benil Darius. I really think that just with the overall power that he has in that right hand, his wrestling as we saw against uh, against uh, Sarukian, that, that Sarukian fight was so technically beautiful. It just, to me, it bums me out that that the wrong person won that fight. And it's not that I'm like, oh, Mateus lost, clearly. It was close. It was really close. But to me, as a judge, judging that fight, it it just seemed to me that they kind of screwed Sarukian. But I'm not, like, mad at Gamera. Like, he, he did everything in his power to win that fight, and the judges rewarded him for it. But with that fight and that performance, right, it was like, damn, this guy is legit elite this guy is very damn good his jiu-jitsu is very damn good his wrestling's good he's good everywhere except in one specific department when it comes to the overall striking acumen like he's very good at wrestling and he's very good at jiu-jitsu and he's got a good right hand but he can't i don't know what it is but to me he just doesn't mix things well together but he, that, that's what makes him kind of dangerous in a sense like he can he can take your weakness and exploit it, right? Like if you can't grapple or you can't wrestle, he's going to take you down, beat you up. If you can grapple, he's going to wrestle you, hold you, and beat the shit out of you in that way. But with Benny Dariush, he mixes things up, I think, a lot better than Mateus Gamrot, right? I'm a big fan of Benio Dariush. He's one of my favorite fighters to watch. The issue with him, though, is that he is kind of chinny and he's a bit reckless in there. He hasn't fought since he beat Tony Ferguson. And honestly, he he hasn't really beaten top level competition. He's been beating finishing people, but to me, the last few fights of Gamrot's you know career, the Armin Surukian fight to me is a lot better of a win 
than, you know, Tony Ferguson and Diego Ferreira and Scotty Holtzman, despite the fact that they both have those two names on there, uh, Holtzman and Ferreira. Ferreira made it close with Benil as to Mateus Garmat, finishing him with a knee to the ass. Mm. So I was like so back and forth. Like I, I, I was just so worried that Mateus was going to knock out Benil Dariush. But then I, I started thinking about it more. I didn't watch too much tape on these two guys because I, I just wanted to avoid that. I was kind of busy. I'm like, I don't want to, you know, take up too much time on one particular fight. So I kind of like use my intuition on this one. I'm like, can Benil win this fight? Like, yeah, he definitely can. How can he win this fight? He has to keep it on the feet to a certain point, mix things up well, go for takedowns. He doesn't necessarily have to keep him down because Mateus is going to be really hard to keep down. But to me, the the X factors being Benil's kicking game. Benil's kicking game, he's being a, he's a southpaw. He kicks so damn hard. Obviously, training with Kings MMA, his jiu-jitsu is going to be solid. So I think those two are going, going to uh, negate each other out. Mateus, being that he... Honestly, I just don't think he's that comfortable on the feet. And we've seen that in the past against Guram Kutataladze, who kind of made him really panic wrestle. Not necessarily panic wrestle. That's a bad way to put it. He made him wrestle because there was no other option. On the feet, he was kind of getting beat up and just... I shouldn't even say beat up either. He was just getting outclassed, and he had to resort to wrestle. Benil Dariush being on the ground and how damn credentialed he is in... in Jiu-Jitsu might make it, whereas to Gamera might not want to engage in that type of you know realm with him. He doesn't maybe he doesn't want to test his ability to get submitted, right? Although they're both high-level grapplers, sometimes it's like ah, what if I get caught? I don't want to deal with that. So he might want to try to keep it standing. If it stays standing, I think Benio Darius has a really good shot to beat Gamera by a decision. It, it's just that Benio, if he gets cracked. With a really right, good right hand, I think it might be lights out for him. Like Gamrod has a has a piston of a right hand. It, it's very solid, but he's not necessarily known as a knockout artist, right? Like he he knocked out uh, who was it Scotty Holtzman, but that was really it, right? He he hasn't really knocked out many more people. I just think that if if Benil's chin holds up, he's going to be able to mix things up a bit better. He'll he'll be winning the striking exchanges, and he'll be smart enough to go for a takedown and just win this by points right he might even finish he might even finish camera like i know he he displayed a fantastic chin against you know most of his competition but there's a big difference between getting hit by armin sarukian who yes he hits hard but if benio dariush goes into like berserker mode and he lands on you clean his chin might not look as good you know so it it might be a bit of a you know favoritism here but I'm going to go with Benil Dariush by decision. I, I like his, you know, being plus 165. I think he's just fought the much better competition. I, I think right now he's much better. My biggest concerns with him are the year layoff, his last fight against Tony Ferguson, his chin. And that's really it, though, right? Like, I do think, despite him being injured, he was supposed to fight Islam Makachev. And a lot of people thought he might be able to beat him because of that, you know, grappling acumen in this case he is training for a much i don't want to say easier opponent but not as a he's not fighting islam anymore right so i think that training camp is going to move over to this fight with Mateus gamma and i think he's going to be very well prepared because he definitely training his wrestling so yeah i'll go with dariush by a decision it's just you know be prepared if you're taking dariush that he uh, gets knocked out Next bout, very interesting bout. I was uh, <laughs> I was with my buddy at his birthday party, and uh, he's like, "Yo, Johnny," he was wearing like a hibachi type style uh, restaurant, like a Benihana. For those of you don't who don't know what a Benihana is, it's like an Asian restaurant where they have a giant grill and they fling shrimp at you to eat like a like a whore. They have you open your mouth. And in my case, he did kind of mention that my girlfriend was a lucky lady because I caught it with my tongue. But he was like, yo, Johnny, who's going to win between O'Malley and Peter Yan? And I told him, I cannot tell you this because it might take me forever to break it down. Go check out the podcast. <laughs> but it's a fascinating matchup. Peter Yan versus Sean O'Malley. Peter Yan minus 310. Comeback on O'Malley is a plus 225, a three-round fight, which is very important 
in how I'm predicting this matchup, right? Again, this is a, a matchup that if I were to do this video like two, four, five days ago, I probably would lean one way. Now that I kind of thought about it a bit more, I'm like, I think I think I have a good feeling on it. This is going to be a fantastic fight. It's going to be a banger of a fight for as long as it lasts because both guys are highly dangerous. And here's the thing about this matchup, right? A lot of people are saying, O'Malley's not going to win. O'Malley, he's taking a shot too too soon, right? He's 15-1. and one. You know, you've got those fresh memories of him getting beat up by by uh, Marlon Vera. You know, the, the recent eye poke issue with Marlon, Marlon, with uh, Munoz. And Peter Jan, obviously, he's an absolute killer, former champion. You know, <laughs> he let a lot of people down with that split decision loss to Aljamain Sterling. But he is still a, a fantastic, dangerous fighter. So to think that him losing to, you know, Aljamain Sterling, you know, obviously, he's a minus 310. Though he still has his, his respect. But to say that he's going to run through Sean O'Malley just because of the XY reason, I just don't think that's the case. So... Uh, Sean O'Malley gets a lot of crap because, you know, as I mentioned, he leg kicks or whatever. Even myself, I'm like, yeah, just kick him in the legs. Like, yes, I think anyone gets kicked in the legs hard enough. It's not going to work well for him. And I kind of started thinking about it. Like, do those leg kicks really hurt him? Like, what is it about him and his ankles and whatever? Like, what is it about Sean O'Malley that causes him to get his legs hurt? Because it's it is a valid thing to say, right? Kick him in the legs. And I know a lot of people might be thinking like, oh, you know, whatever. It's not his weakness. And to an extent, it's not. But when you see him, you know, getting carried out in a stretcher with his fight against Andre Sukumtat, and the same thing similar to uh, what happened with uh, Marlon Vera, where he had to get stretchered out because of his legs, you start wondering, like, is that an issue? I don't think leg kicks are the issue when it comes to that. I think something else is, and I'll mention it in a bit. But to say that bringing up leg kicks is invalid, I don't think that's invalid. I just think more of a, it's a conversation that should be had, not maybe always to bring it up, but just keeping it in mind, like bringing it up isn't like a terrible fucking thing. But in this fight, Peter Jan, clearly the, the favorite here. He should be the former champion. He's so good everywhere, right? He can take you down. He is... He's a killer. The biggest issue, right? Like, I don't want to tell you everything about Peter Yan. If you're watching this, you know who Peter Yan is. You know what he's capable of. The former champion, former interim champion, he's beaten. He's killed a lot of people in the cage, right? He beat the crap out of Diego. Uh, what's his name? Oh, my God. The, the rat hair. <laughs> he just murdered him. Let me find out because I'm embarrassed that I can't remember his name. He's the guy that when you... Uh, put money against him, he will give you a devastating finish. D Douglas Silva de Andrade, he absolutely battered Douglas de Andrade. Like, he's a tough guy. He beat the crap out of him. He obviously killed, uh, <laughs> killed. oh, my God, Jose Aldo. Dude, I'm watching the fight on my phone in Vegas because I couldn't find it anywhere. I had to resort to putting it on my phone, buying it, and then uh, watching it on my phone, and me seeing – him just destroy Jose Aldo was like, oh my God, this guy's going to be champion for a long time as long as he doesn't get smothered by a black wrestler. And uh, yeah, but the guy is just so talented. Like he's just an absolute killer when he decides to be. And when I mentioned it's a three round fight, if Peter Yan takes too damn long to analyze Sean O'Malley, who is very fast, very sharp with his punches, great cardio, um, good kicks. He, he's just so crafty, right? To discredit Sean O'Malley it, it's kind of gotten old, right? Like you can't keep discrediting this guy. I know I bet against him. If you're keeping track, I bet against him against Pedro Munoz. I thought Pedro was going to beat him and maybe had the fight gone longer. I could have won. It was a very uneventful fight, but I, I really did think Pedro won that first round. Don't give me any bullshit on it. You know, I, I don't remember the fight so much. So if you're like, well, he did this and I'm like, I don't give a fuck. I thought that he beat him in that first round, but Again, if Peter Yan takes too long to analyze Sean O'Malley and he's kind of circling around him, throwing kicks and staying on the outside, he's going to be much taller, 5'11", compared to the 5'7", of Peter Yan, 72-inch reach compared to the 62-inch reach. I don't care how much better Peter Yan is than Sean O'Malley. On paper, it's a fist fight. And if Sean O'Malley just kind of 
works his game plan where he's on the outside and moves forward only to attack from a safe distance with his long arms and legs, it could be kind of an embarrassing fight for Peter Yan to lose, a fight that maybe people thought he had won, but Sean O'Malley just did enough. And that's the thing with Peter Yan. His biggest weakness is that he doesn't do much sometimes. He takes too long. Corey Sanhagen was winning that fight until Peter Yan decided it's time for me to go. And he decided to go and he beat the crap out of him, right? He dropped him. I, I kind of even think he broke Corey Sandhagen a bit. He wasn't the same after that fight. So it's just how long is it going to take Peter Yan? If you're taking a shot on Sean O'Malley plus 255, God, it's not even a thing about balls. It's just smarts, right? You have to take a shot on Sean O'Malley to really create the upset. I don't think it's that big of an upset for him to beat Peter Yan. On paper it is, but... In reality, skill-wise, I think Sean O'Malley is finally getting to that point where he's putting things together. He hits incredibly hard, obviously, right? He's got a ton of knockouts. This gimmick, you might not like the guy. I personally don't really like him. Jose calls him Krusty the Clown because the hair. You know, I, I thought he deserved to get his ass beat against Marlon Vera because you don't talk about Marlon Vera and not expect to get your, your head bounced off the canvas. So I do think he is very, very live to win this fight. But when I mentioned the issue with Sean O'Malley, why his legs kind of get battered a bit. The biggest issue I think I see with Sean O'Malley, and I could be completely wrong, is that when he does too much with his movement, I think that is it, right? He he creates too many possibilities for him or too many openings for him to roll his ankles or to hurt himself because he's bouncing it around a lot. He's got great movement. He kind of faints like a lot. He moves, he, he does a lot of that bouncing in and out. With that, it creates the openings for him to potentially roll his ankle. Say if Peter Yan decides to just go full pressure, and, and that's really all Sean O'Malley, or not Sean, but Peter Yan is doing is just pressuring, hands up. He's got a great guard, by the way, Peter Yan. Fantastic guard. Absolutely love it. Like he's, his hands are always in the right spot, but he moves forward, uh, possibly tries to wrestle Sean O'Malley, which I think he will. And Sean's just kind of moving in and out. If that's all he does for at least two rounds, there's always that possibility that Sean O'Malley missteps, kind of hurts himself, right? He's been hurt before. And, and that little X factor makes me think, mm, maybe maybe with my actual pick, I'll, I'll have to stick with Peter Yan. Because although I do think Sean O'Malley is incredibly live to win this one, and I am betting Sean O'Malley to win just to have that ticket in case he wins, for those of you who know, suck my dick. I won. Um, and I told you so, by the way. Uh, I do think that that pressure from Peter Yan is going to be a little too much for Sean O'Malley, right? Again, I really, really, really do think Sean wins this fight if he is very smart on the outside. But Peter Yan, I, I think if he comes out here proving a point, if he stops the bullshit and just fights, I, I think he beats the shit out of Sean O'Malley, if he does that. But it's just really, will Peter Yan do what Peter Yan does and kind of wait a little bit, move forward, analyze? That That's what bothers me about Peter Yan. If he's out here for blood and he's no mercy, he goes for the takedown, he trips down Sean O'Malley, gets on top, and just batters him. And again, it's not to say that Sean can't get back up or that Sean has a weak jujitsu game. Like he is definitely putting in his, his rounds and his rolling time. It's just really that pressure from Peter Yan. If he implements it, I do think Sean O'Malley, I don't want to say he crumbles, but I, I think the pressure is just going to be too much for him for that particular reason. I will take no mercy Peter Yan to win this fight. I do think he's priced out. He's not worth really putting on any parlays, it's going to be a fun fight, right? Like I am taking a shot. Even if I lose the bet, I'm perfectly fine with that. Taking a shot on Sean O'Malley because I do believe he has the skills, the capability to win this fight. It's just that he, he has to mix things up himself, right? If he decides to just stay on the outside and kind of tape him and punch him from long distances, he can have success for maybe two rounds. But that third round, if Peter Yan decides to like move in, it could be a bit hairy if Sean O'Malley decides to go for his own takedowns, kind of do the same route. He has a big body. If he can backpack Peter Yan, that would be so fucking smart, right? Like, not to say that it's the only way to beat Peter Yan, but having a big body with those legs and backpacking Peter Yan, 
it, it could really no, number one it's going to bring a lot of booze from the audience but it, it could just be like a new facet for peter or uh, sean o'malley to be like yeah i'm willing to do what i have to do to win these fights so if he can do that here it would be impressive right i not in the sense of like wow he he fucking decisioned him really boring but it'd just be impressive to see his progression but again i'm gonna go with peter Yan. you know what i, I think again if, i'm predicting peter Yan goes no mercy here so i'm gonna say round number three he tkos sean o'malley again if he does what i expect him to do pressure pressure go inside take him down again his trips are very good he doesn't use a whole ton of energy to trip a guy down and if if he can catch Sean O'Malley kind of moving in a certain way, his legs get crossed up, simple takedown, just kind of sweep him, knock him down, get on top and just pound him out. That'd be interesting. So I'll go with third round TKO for Peter Yan. But again, I'm, I'm super live Sean O'Malley. Next bout ooh, went too far. Next bout Aljamain Sterling versus TJ Dillashaw, the co-main event for the UFC Bantamweight Championship. The Funk Master currently is minus 170 tj thriller shaw billa shaw dollar dollar killer shaw i think i fucked that up is plus 145 36 years old nearly 37 uh, compared to the 33 year old from new york it's a west coast versus east coast here i'm a west coast boy so and that should kind of tell you a lot but when it comes to this fight like there's too many x factors and variables when it comes to TJ Dillashaw fight in 2022 after the suspension. How good is he? How good is he coming back? How good is he after a knee surgery? Like if this was if this fight happened, say he didn't get suspended and the immediate challenger was Aljamain Sterling, I would have taken TJ Dillashaw every day. His wrestling is incredible. You know, he He's, he's the total package, really. The striking that Dwayne Ludwig really bestowed upon him with that mixture of the style from like uh, the, the the bang kickboxing style with the similar hybrid movement of Dominic Cruz that whether he wants to admit it or not, he did get influenced by it. it was just such a force, man. He's I I'm a TJ Dillashaw fan, right? The EPO bullshit, you know, it sucks for people that like TJ, but he's a very fun fighter to watch. And he's a very good fighter, despite the EPO crap. When it comes to Aljamain Sterling, he has really overperformed from what I thought he would be. Like his striking is not the greatest, but he's got a lot of output. The problem with drinking soda on these streams, like you end up burping. He's got a ton of output. He... He uses his length very well, right? He's five foot seven himself, 71 inch reach, uses those legs very well. He moves forward well. He's relentless with the wrestling. His cardio did fail him in that first fight with Peter Jan, but, you know, he, he did what he had to do to win the belt. You see. And against the second fight, he did exactly what he needed to do to win the belt as well. Like, he hate to admit it, he won that fight. It wasn't a Peter Jan win. I was hoping for a, you know, Peter Jan decision, but. It went in the favor of Aljamain Sterling that night just because he had done so much when it came to the the backpacking. And there was a, a big discussion, just to get this out of the way, about those first few rounds where he took the back and people called it domination. And it, it was like, a, oh, should these be a 10-8? Let me uh, explain to you as a, as a judge. And I guess the funniest way I can tell you is that if I wanted to get dominated right like say i went to a professional and i'm like excuse me miss i would like you to dominate me here's my money and then she gets on my back and triangles my body and then just holds me and then kind of smacks me around a little bit i'd ask for my fucking money back because that is not domination that is just stalling to a point having a dominant position and stalling when it comes to a, i guess judging about I'm just getting this out of the way because I was pissed off when people talked about that 10-8. If I have the full mount position and I am heavy on top of somebody, and to, to give you an example just so you can kind of picture it, if I sit on top of a toddler who cannot get up and I sit on top of him for five minutes and I occasionally grab his arm and have him hit himself, 
yes, I am in a dominant position. Yes, I am in a way controlling him for a duration of the time, but I am not dominating the kid because I'm not striking him. If I was dominating him, he'd be bloody and it would have stopped the fight. But in this particular type of matchup, right, where, where a guy takes a guy's back and backpacks him and doesn't really do much, maybe the occasional elbow, that does not, to me, warrant a 10-8. Like, had he done that from the beginning of the, of the match, of the round, hits him a ton of times, uh, transitions position, like, really, really shows dominance, at that point I'd consider a 10-8. But there has to be the three Ds, as they call it, uh, duration dominance and damage damage being the key you usually need two of those but for me damage is always the number one you can't necessarily hold a guy against the cage for five minutes and land the occasional pot shot and the other guy's like help help referee no you have to do damage so just got to rant that shit out of my system but in this fight i think that would be aljamain's only i shouldn't say the only way to victory that'd be his more logical way to victory because tj He's a much better striker, but you know, to say that Aljamain can knock him out would be ludicrous, right? I, I do think Aljamain, although he's not really knocked people out with the fists, he can possess a bit of power. He's he's a very big guy. He's very strong. It's just more so TJ Dillashaw's chin at this point, right? He's looking in phenomenal shape. They both are. Uh, it, it's just so tough because to me, Aljamain Sterling is very one dimensional. He's just got the wrestling. And if he doesn't want to really tangle on the ground, he does have the output with the striking. But that's really it. When you got a guy like TJ Dillashaw who has the power, who has the ability to create openings to, like, kick your head in, it, he's got the more knockout threat to his side. He's got the wrestling himself. Al has been out-wrestled before, you know, not to an extent of, like, oh, my God, he's getting dominated, but he has been out-wrestled. He's not, like, this ultimate wrestler who can't get taken down. TJ can definitely mix things up. TJ is going to have the cardio advantage. It's just more so TJ at 36, nearly 37 years old. Are you going to take a shot on him? I'm going to say yes, fuck it. I'll, I'll take a shot on TJ just because it's more of a leap of faith. Logically, right, Aljamain should win this one. I, I think he's clever enough and he's smart enough to create a proper game plan to really negate the striking of TJ and his timing, maybe through a leg kick I think that'd be very smart uh, attacking the calf of TJ Dillashaw to really limit his movement would be very wise attacking the knees. You know, I think Al has got more of a, like a John Jones type of style with that length that he possesses at bantamweight where you can attack the knees. It, it's just to me, I think Dillashaw, if he's on his game, I think he really hurts Al Sterling. I, I think he really puts a pressure on him, gets him tired because it, between these two, I think Al would be the one to tire before TJ Dillashaw, but I do think TJ Dillashaw's body would break before Aljamain Sterling. So it's a really interesting fight because again, it's more of the threat of the damage coming from TJ, but the, I guess, overall durability that Aljamain's body possesses. And if he were to do certain techniques, I think it would benefit him a lot. Like again, using those uh, teeps up the middle but again, is he going to use too much energy? That, that's what I worry about Aljamain. I don't think he's going to backpack TJ because TJ, again, he's a very strong guy. He's a very strong grappler. Oh, man, I just uh, – I, I don't feel comfortable taking Aljamain Sterling because, again, he's he's been out-wrestled even by Peter Yan to a certain point. He's getting flopped around. So I'm going to take a shot on TJ. Just, literally just that. I'm taking a shot just because, again – I. I I, I'm kind of going with a bias pick, but I'm going to go with TJ to get the win. I'm going to say, ooh, I'm going to say fifth round TKO. I think he, it's going to be incredible back and forth. I think Aljamain might win a couple rounds and then TJ wins the next two. And then the fifth round comes out and whoever's cardio flinches first, which I think is going to be Aljamain's is going to be the one that falls off the cliff. They're going to play a uh, chicken. <laughs> and TJ is going to end up winning this one. So I'll go with TJ Dillashaw, fifth round TKO. It's 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 really fun. I'm excited, man. It's a really good matchup. Like I know a lot of people are giving TJ a bunch of crap, like, oh, why are they giving him the shot? It's, it's a good matchup. It really is. Like TJ, 
former champion Aljamain Sterling, the current champion, the the shit talk that's going to happen at the press conference is going to be great. You know, you've got the the backstory of the fallen hero. Well, I shouldn't say hero. People hated TJ, but the fallen champion coming back to reclaim his belt. And if he does that, that's incredibly significant. The guy that, you know, lost his belt twice and then he got it back, uh, I guess, three times. Yeah, the first time, second. Yeah, that'd be fascinating, right? He comes back and he redeems himself. And then he might even have a fight with Peter Young. That'd be fantastic man daddy's back tj dillashaw but it's, i'm not counting out al Jermaine, right like i know i kind of don't like al Jermaine. a lot of people don't after the antics that he pulled but to discredit him and his abilities is kind of ludicrous although i kind of did that like i do think he's just very one-dimensional he doesn't really possess a whole ton of threat but yeah i'll go with uh with tj on this one more so as just like a I'll die on that hill with TJ Dillashaw as a fan. So TJ, it is for me, fifth round knockout. Next bout, Charles Oliveira versus Islam Makachev. Du Bronx versus Islam doesn't have a nickname, but minus 180 for Islam. Come back on Charles, Du Bronx, Oliveira, Le Champion, uh, plus 155. Holy crap, man. This fight, I can spend about a good hour kind of breaking it down. Like, no tape watch needed. I can break this one down. It is literally one of the best matchups, best fights that could be ever put on paper and on pay-per-view. Um, taking place in Abu Dhabi is going to be an added thing, right? Because you've got the overwhelming support literally from the fans and the broadcast desk for Islam Akasha because DC is going to be going to be commentating I, I posted a meme on the discord it is of a duck biting a tiny monkey's penis and i said when <laughs> charles Oliveira uh, pulls guard on islam and dc counts that as a takedown for islam he bites his penis <laughs> it's just fucking funny but that's really going to be the case and as much as i love dc i'm a, I'm a big fan of dc He's incredibly biased when it comes to certain fighters, right? He'll like, oh, you, you see that, Joe? You got a takedown, Joe? I'm like, no, he didn't get a takedown. With uh, with Charles Oliveira, we've got the threat, mostly the three threats from Charles Oliveira. We've got the obviously the jujitsu threat, the submission threat. That's that's a major thing when it comes to Oliveira's submission game. His lankiness and his creativity, his willingness, creates this overwhelming submission threat no matter where you are whether you're on top of him or he's on top of you he is incredibly dangerous like he even just recently said that his favorite technique is the calf slicer nobody's fucking favorite technique is the calf slicer you'll usually get like the shit you can typically do like for me for example my favorite thing was the head and arm triangle because i number one could never pull it off correctly because i was such a noob at the time and I realized, oh, you use your shoulder to choke him, <laughs> you stupid idiot. Don't use all your arms. So that was my favorite technique. You'll get people like, oh, my favorite is the triangle or, you know, the Kimura or the Americana. Whose fucking thing is a calf slicer? The calf slicer is the favorite technique of a guy that can pull off every technique that he gets so bored with them that he's like, eh, let me destroy someone's calf real quick. And that's Charles Oliveira. His second obvious um, pillar when it comes to, like, how dangerous he is, is the striking, right? His striking has gotten a lot cleaner with Diego Lima. Shoot a box. You know, he's got the power. He's got the technique, right? Like he's always kind of had the ability to knock people out. He's always had the striking, the, the kickboxing, the Muay Thai. Even when he came into the UFC, they, they kind of sucked his dick on the kickboxing. Oh, he's so talented. Joe uh, Rogan says, and he gets submitted by a <laughs> Jim Miller by an e-bar. But yeah, it's kind of funny. He is he has been tapped out quite a bit. But when it comes to that striking as of late, man, that left hook that he landed on on uh, my boy, Michael Chandler, it was a picture-perfect left hook. And I'm like, damn, this guy has really come a long way. And finally, the third thing that makes him so dangerous is that Super Saiyan blonde hair. He's he's fully blonde, and he's going to have a shit ton of fun in this octagon against Islam Mahashev. Now, I've really had a really tough time picking Charles Oliveira fights. And let me actually read you the, the odds if I haven't already. Minus 180 for Makachev, plus 155 for Du Bronx. And when I say that, it's like I, I still have that like, oh, he's a quitter, he's a quitter. 
even when I'm like, he's not a quitter. I'm like, he might still have some quit in him. Justin Gage, he will find it. And I pick Justin and he's proven me wrong. A lot of the times, like I had a lot of money on Michael Chandler to knock him out and different referee, Michael Chandler, probably not the UFC champion now, but at the time he would have been UFC champion. Dustin Poirier, for me, that fight was easy as hell. Uh, Dustin Poirier is going to get choked out. I got that one right. And then I chose Justin Gagey, despite the fact that at that point when I picked him, I'm like, yeah, Charles is definitely the real deal. But I think if Justin fights a certain way, a very smart fight, he can win. He did not. And then Charles, uh, <laughs> he, he found the chin of Justin and he made him quit. He choked him out. Islam Makhachev, number one, not a fan of him, not a fan of his style. He's very boring, but dear God, is he so damn technical? He's, he's such a fantastic wrestler. And really, he's just that one-dimensional, right? He's going to be in a lot of danger when it comes to Charles Oliveira, either moving forward and on the ground. We see that he obviously wants to take you down, Islam, that is, and he will take Charles down, guaranteed. It's more on the feet that I worry is, is Charles going to knock him out. He even said himself, round number one knockout, I'm getting Islam Makhachev. And I believe him. I really do believe he can do that because Islam's been cracked before. His striking's not all that great. It's getting better, right? His boxing's getting better. It's just more so Charles, if he connects on you now, right, he's gotten bigger. He's, he's, he's a grown man now. He's, what, 33 years old. He has kids now. And that little switch that hits a guy – a fighter when they have kids and they finally mature, it's just like, wow, like he, he's putting it all together. So he's incredibly dangerous on the feet, on the ground, everywhere. Even his wrestling's fantastic. And to me, the threat of the submission is, is very high when it comes to Islam, you know, attacking for takedowns, but it's not, the end all be all like going and shooting for a takedown on Charles Oliveira isn't always going to lead to you getting guillotine or you getting, you know, your back taken. Islam definitely is going to have success here against Charles Oliveira, right? When he decides to wrestle, which he will, he will immediately decide to wrestle the moment he, he feels the wind of the punch that grazes the top of his head because he's going to duck under for that takedown. He's like, I'm not standing with this guy. And I guarantee you he'll shoot immediately. He'll stay on the outside. He might throw a kick. He'll shoot. And I think he's going to get the first takedown easily, the second one, the third one, the fourth one. And he's going to have to avoid the submission game of Charles Oliveira. And I think he will. And it pains me to say because I hate to be in this camp again where I'm picking against Charles Oliveira, but I've always had my doubts about how to beat Charles. And I even said to myself, like, if I get the chance to break it down, why I think there's a way to beat Charles Oliveira, I'm going to go full full uh, mental here and explain it. I, I think that if you engage Charles Oliveira on the ground and you're not afraid and you're not a chicken shit, you've got a lot of success there. Look back at the people who have had success with Charles, people who were unafraid to engage him on the ground. You hurt Charles. He goes and flops to his back. That seems to be the Diego Lima shooter box way these days. You get hurt, you go flop on your back and just be like, all right, let's go, let's do this as you recover. If you don't give him a chance to recover and he is stunned, you get on top of him, you pass guard and you elbow him to death. You Paul Felder the shit out of him, man. And that's the thing. Paul Felder, as much as he was pissing me off last week with his commentary, he, he was unafraid of that Charles Oliveira top game maybe because he didn't know what was coming yet yeah he's incredibly dangerous but he was just kind of dumb enough to be like i don't care i've got him in a good position i'm gonna elbow him he tapped out right you you tapped him there that's what i think is going to happen here i don't think islam's going to necessarily knock him out but i think islam's going to really have his way with him on the ground and charles will eventually get back up and kind of be a bit desperate it, it's just the scary part and why I'm not betting this fight. The scary part is because Charles has that ability to knock you out on the feet and doesn't care if he gets taken down, flying knees, flying front kicks, flying anything, flying go-go platas, flying arm bars, flying triangles. That's what makes this fight so fascinating, right? Like I do really think Islam has to fight a very strategic fight, which I know he has it in him. He's got the cardio. He's got the wrestling. 
his chin may not be able to withstand a, a clean knee or a clean elbow from from Islam. That's another thing, though. Keep in mind, if Islam shoots sloppy, like, oh, I'm going to go for a takedown, he gets a knee up the middle. Even if he doesn't knock him out, that neck is exposed and he is donezo. Which, man, I really want Charles to win. It's just that because like, I need to die on that sword that I really do think that if you control Charles on the ground, you you can definitely definitely beat him there. Like he's not incredibly dangerous on the ground to the point that like once you get in his guard, you're screwed. You can pass guard. You can defend. It's more so when you panic and you want to get out of there. It's where he catches you, right? Like um, Justin, not Justin. Um, oh my God, Michael Chandler was able to reverse. Charles Oliveira, he had his back, he reversed him. And the, the reason I thought Chandler would beat him because I've seen Michael Chandler do that shit. I've seen him fight guys like Goiti Yamaguchi in, in Bellator. He's fought some great grapplers and he's just got that style. He's got that strength. Islam has that similar type of wrestling, that similar grappling pedigree where he can defend and he knows how to keep calm and he's not going to freak out. And as much as it pains me to say that, I think Islam's going to win this fight by a decision. I think it's going to be boring. We're going to issue in a new... Boring as age of the lightweight champion, but oh, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna hear a loud like Whoa! like if I if I ever do these live right if you're ever doing like a fight companion live part of the reason I don't do those is because number one I, I say a lot of messed up racist shit. <laughs> mostly about like my uh, race but uh, anyways um, I say a lot of messed up stuff and I just don't want to get in trouble and also because like I get too damn loud and. Uh, yeah, if I were to record it, which I might, because just the chance that Charles knocks him out, you, I'll I'll learn how to do a backflip right then and there. Uh, but now, unfortunately, I do think that Islam Makhachev is going to kind of be a boring blanket, and Charles is going to kind of squirm around a bit, and you'll kind of see the fight leave him a bit as he gets taken down, his gas tank goes away. But again, as the fight progresses, I'm going to be like, oh my god, flying knee him, flying knee him. But yeah. I, it's 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 gonna be fun, really. Um, it's gonna be fun to see Charles like in that first round come out there because he has zero fear. That's what I really like about Charles Oliveira. Now he he doesn't care. He'll go out there. You try to take him down, he will try to submit you or take something with you. Oh boy, I, I'm really hoping. Like, leave a comment. What do you think is gonna happen in this matchup? I know it's like 50-50, really, because with with Charles being so dangerous everywhere, it just we might see a maybe a tentative Islam Akashev again. Like if he feels that power and if he gets caught in a tight guillotine where he's like, I don't want to shoot from that angle again. And his takedowns are just not as effective. We'll see. We'll see what happens, right? There's a lot that can happen in a, in a fist fight, especially with two skilled guys like this. But again, like I just think that Islam's just going to kind of blanket him because he's, he's kind of have that zero fury. I think he even mentioned it himself. Like you don't engage Charles Oliveira on the ground, like you, you got him hurt, go to the ground and finish him or do something. Like a lot of people have just been too chicken shit because of that. It's cost him. I really don't think Islam's going to have that, that problem. So again, Islam Makhachev by a decision, but you know me, if we can have a, a moment where, you know, Islam's dominating everywhere and then we get a head kick kind of like Marty and Leon. Oh my God. My woman's getting loving that night. But, yeah, those are my predictions for the fight. Let me see what we have for possible bets. I have not bet this card yet. I don't really fully think I'm going to go all out. Like, I've had a good amount of success with last week's card with, um, what's her name, uh, the Mexican and the Brazilian chick, BV Araujo and um, Alexa Grasso. Although Grasso won that fight like clearly like i don't know if, if you have it any controversially like oh you know was it close now i think grasso won it even though i picked vivi and i actually put money on her she uh oh she looked bad vivi i uh, thought she was like i won this fight no you didn't no you didn't bitch um overall picks went pretty well uh, most of my bets cashed i had a couple that were like flutters like hey why not i'll take a shot on this person but most of them cashed by the way that moron mana martinez Ooh, I kept saying, like, uh, James Krause should kick him out of the gym for that bullshit. 
Like you were supposed to go in there, left hook him, go home. I was telling my brother, like, oh, this guy I got, Mana Martinez, like he's from Houston, H Town. He's gonna left hook him, and we're gonna go home with our money. And no, he made it too close. So I think because of that, I, I might be a bit tentative to to kind of be that confident in certain picks. But if I was to create possibly a parlay, I'm gonna take Carol Rosa, not going big on it. Like I'm gonna probably do like a ten dollar parlay. I'm going to go with Zubaira Tukagov. I think he wins it pretty soundly. Damn. Like every fight is so close. I'll go with Islam Makhachev, but I got to be prepared for if I get every single fight correctly and Islam comes up and he gets knocked out, that is the price you pay. I'm going to take Peter Yan on this one again. If he loses, it is what it is. Who Manon Firo versus Caitlin Chukagian for that. I don't have the prop for the over, but I'll take the over. That ain't getting finished worth a damn. Uh, let's see. Muradov. I will take Muradov to win this one, but I'll probably have him inside the distance. He's not listed on my little sheet here. Inside the distance, so I'll take him just tentatively as a... I'll just take a money line. What else we got here? I'll take... Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov. I I don't feel comfortable enough going straight on him. Again, I might not even do many straight bets. I might just kind of live bet, but I'll take him in a dumb parlay where I'm okay losing. I'll take Kayo Bohalio to win this one. Everywhere else, I see just too many possibilities for bullshit. Like AJ Dobson, I'm I'm gonna pick him straight, actually take a shot on him. But I you know, we'll see. We'll see. Because I, I do think he possesses a little bit of the X factor, that strength, that that uh, that camp with him, right? Like if if um, <laughs> if Mark Coleman taught him all his forbidden techniques, not the ones from Pride where he gets paid to lose fights, but like the good ones, like <laughs> put your put your uh, head on his head and put pressure down, and as you're like doing other crap, maybe stick your finger up his butt or something, shit like that. We might see an interesting fight with AJ Dobson. And let's see, Nikita Krylov, no. Because I'm assuming that the fight with Manon Firo is going to go over, and I'm assuming it's going to be like minus 300, I'll, I'll just list it down, Manon Firo. She's minus 225. So I have eight overall picks here. I've got Rosa, Tukagov, Makhachev, Peter Yan, Mokaev, which I'll go inside the distance, so, uh, what is this here? Minus 1,000 is the line that I have on Mokaev right now. Abu Bakar, Kyle Bohalio, and Manan Firo. I'll take the over on that. So, substituting those two, the minus 1,000, minus 225 for Manan Firo and Islam or uh, Mohammed Mokaev. At the very moment, that gives me plus. 1615. So if I put say 20 bucks on that, it gives me $322. So I might actually do that one. If you're interested in following me on Instagram, actually don't fucking follow me on Instagram. I don't really use that. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter. You'll see this. I'll post a picture of it. It might not be exactly like this because I might play around with it with like over-unders and whatnot, but I'll probably take a shot on this. I call it my retard parlay. Uh, crap. I shouldn't have said that. I call it my, uh, my dumbass parlay. Um, and usually the game is, who fucks me in this particular parlay and winner gets the satisfaction of shitting on me on Twitter. But uh, those have been my picks predictions for UFC 280. Should have changed the thing. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Make sure you like, share, subscribe. Sorry about this being super late. Just got kind of busy. But yeah, Johnny from Tiger Bomb. Uh, fuck Olberg.